All right, Matthew 18, 21. Peter, who did he go to? He went to Jesus. He said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and, and I forgive him? And then he asked him another question. He says, up to seven times. Am I supposed to give my, forgive my brother seven times? And Jesus said to him, be prepared. Jesus said a lot to him because Jesus took over in this conversation right then. He said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. You know how many people will take a calculator and figure that up and say it's 490 times and then I'm done with you. That isn't what Jesus meant. It was just a figure of speech. Any amount. It's not an amount. You forgive all the time. And then Jesus told him a story. He said there was a, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when one had began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master said that he be sold and his wife and children and all that he had that payment would be made. And then the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him for the debt. Now, I'm kind of stopped right there just to throw this in. Here's a man that has been forgiven for, for his debts until he can pay them back. And here's the same man Listen to what he did. But that servant, talking about the one that had just been forgiven, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred uh, denarii and laid hands on him and took him by the throat and saying, pay me what you owe me. Here's a man who's just been forgiven his debts. And he goes and grabs one of his own servants and grabs him by the throat and says, you need to pay me what you owe me. Now, whether he was out trying to make the money that he was going to pay back to his master. Or not. It, the Bible don't say what it's trying to show you here. Here's somebody has been forgiven. Same situation, the same things being done. How's he going to react to it? So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Same thing he just done to his master. And he would not but went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then the master said, after he had called him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until uh, he should pay all that was due him. Look at verse 35. A lot of people stop the story right there because they don't like to read verse 35. Verse 35 said, so my heavenly father, this is Jesus talking, mind you. My heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Strong, isn't it? You know, even when we're saying the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as what? As we forgive those who trespass against us. Same story right here. We're out studying right now, throwing the net, going out, telling the people about Jesus. And we wonder how we're going to do it. Uh, we talked a uh, couple of Sunday nights ago about doing it prayerfully. You know, tonight we're going to be making it perpetual. Perpetual means never ending. There's no ending. It's like this forgiven. There's no ending to the forgiven. Uh, the writer here said one subtle, subtle danger of the public appeal when we're out telling people out about Christ and ask them, you know, to come to Jesus is that some people may uh, think it is the best and perhaps the only forum in which people may decide for Christ. And what he's saying here is we come to church to do it. We come into church, we have a public appeal. The minister 
makes the appeal at the end of the service for you to come to the altar and accept Jesus as your personal Savior. If they don't get saved then, uh, a lot of people think, well, we'll have to wait the next Sunday. Next Sunday, they make it. That's the only time you can do it. It's a, it's a set time. Let me tell you, humans have got too much set time in things when it comes to concerning, concerning God's love and God sharing his love with everybody. You can get saved anytime, anyplace, anywhere. But 50 years ago, and I remember, now we didn't have a two-week July or August revival. We had a revival. It was a five-day revival. We had it uh, either in the spring, and then we had another one in the fall. There was two weeks, but it won't be like uh, this writer evidently. His church did it different. They had a two-week revival, and it was either in July or August each year, and it was the time to get saved. You know, during that revival, two-week period, time to get saved. And uh, he said if certain individuals went through the protracted meaning without responding and didn't come to Christ during that two-week, you know what they started saying? The congregation, they started saying, let's pray that maybe next August uh, that he or she will be saved. That's wild, isn't it? You got to wait next year. If you, can't, if you don't get saved during this revival, you got to wait the next year. I heard David Jeremiah say one time that you'd be surprised how many calls he gets, but one that really stuck to me uh, one morning he was doing his uh, little study and, and he made the comment. He said, I, God can be received anywhere. You can accept Jesus anywhere, no matter where you are. Or, or what condition you are in, you can receive Jesus. He said, I just got a phone call from a truck driver that heard my message while he was riding down the interstate, pulled off the side of the interstate and prayed to God that Jesus would come into his heart and got saved right there in his own truck. No preacher around him, he had just heard the message and he accepted Jesus as his personal savior. It's a never ending, never ending. And, uh, so don't get into that mistake that there's a certain time you have to be saved. But you can be saved anytime, any place, anywhere. The appeal to follow Christ uh, should be never ending. It should be uh, spread throughout the environment of the entire church. Once you leave here, you can still help people come to know Jesus. You can do it outside the church. You don't have to be in a church building. And Tell the people more about Christ. So I think what we have talked about the last few weeks on this cast in the net is what do we do as individuals? Uh, how are we supposed to do it? We, we always question ourselves. How do I do it? I'm scared. I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death to even approach anybody. I'm scared to death to approach anybody at work or anywhere I'm at and tell them about Jesus. Uh, that's because a lot of people are taught that you go and confront people and say, will you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Well, some of them don't even know who Jesus Christ is. They don't know whether they want to accept him as their personal Savior or not. You've got to tell them a little bit about the story of Jesus. You know, if you read where Peter preached after Pentecost, and if you read some of Paul's sermons that he did, they start back there at the beginning, and they go through the whole story. They go through the whole story and tell it uh, the way it was. Uh, so it's the way that we approach these people. Uh, it begins in our own Jerusalem. We got our own, everywhere, did you know everywhere you actually got your own little Jerusalem? That's where Jesus lives. That's where he lived when, when he was here. He lived in Jerusalem. In those places, you can have your own Jerusalem. What's the new, what's the new heaven going to be called? It's called the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And, if you want to do some study on that, it don't come all the way down to the earth either. It comes part of the way down. But it's called the New Jerusalem. But uh, we can cast that net and we can draw that net. It don't matter where we are or what we're doing. Uh, sometimes you don't even have to say a word. You just have to be you. You have to show the love that people's not used to seeing. Don't argue with them. It's a love that shines it's like it's like the story i told you this morning about the lady that walked and i don't know nothing about the light being around me but she said i saw the light when i walked out here and saw you it, it must have been the way i was acting or i was in the spirit then or something but she saw the light 
she saw in me. She knew I was a Christian when she saw me. And, uh, and, and that does your heart good that somebody can see you like that. But and sometimes that's all it takes. And I didn't know whether that lady was a Christian or not, but I told her my story. And when I told her my story, she said, man, I can't wait to get home and tell my husband because he's going through the same thing. He's been running. It won't 42 years like I run, but he's been running a long time. And he's got all the stuff he needs to be, and he don't know whether Christ is really calling him into the ministry or not. But he's running. And she said, I can't wait to tell him your story. I said, well, let me know what the outcome. In fact, I even invited her and her husband uh, since he was from Goldsboro and grew up in Goldsboro. I said, y'all get together with uh, me and Barbara one day, and we go out and eat, and me and him can talk a lot and have a good time. But... You know, it don't matter what you do in your church, what kind of ministry you're running in your church. Uh, you make every ministry, whether it's teaching Sunday school, whether it's having Bible school, it don't matter what you're doing. You make every ministry an opportunity for somebody to receive Christ as their personal Savior. That's what it's all about. It's not about the meetings. It's not about... Things like it's about ministering. It's about making Bible school, making Sunday school a ministry. And they, uh, this guy here, I'll read you this part. He said they had a, uh, a cancer support ministry with the underlying motive to present a personal appeal uh, to receive the Lord. Even in their cancer, cancer uh, support ministry where the ministry team went out, their number one goal was to make sure everybody knew Christ. That's the personal savior. And when you're working church business, that should be the number one thing in anything that you are doing. Make a personal appeal that people can receive the Lord as their personal savior. And uh, what does that do? It kind of fulfills the great commission, don't it? When Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We all know what the gospel is. The gospel is about Jesus Christ about him uh, being born, by him living, him dying on the cross, going into the tomb, rising again, and the way he talked, the way he acted, he left a perfect pattern. How many of you can name a person other than Jesus Christ that went through this world for 6, 000, the last 6,000 years? We go all the way back to Genesis and come up to today. How many people walked on this earth and we're perfect. One. One. Jesus Christ himself. Without sin is what the Bible says. He didn't sin. Now, he would got tempted. We used the excuse sometimes, well, I sinned because I was tempted and the temptation was so bad that I just went ahead and, and, you know, I couldn't get over it. Jesus was tempted just like you are tempted without sin. He was perfect, and no one else has ever been like that. And that, sin, that sinless person, a human being, just like you and I, better than us, but just like you and I, took it upon himself to go on a cross, take all the sins of the world, take them upon himself, and die. And Satan clapped. He's dead. Three days later, Satan won't clap in anymore because he not only defeated sin, he defeated death. And he gives us eternal life so that we know when we leave this world that we, we're going to one or two places, but we know when we leave this world, we're going and be with that same Jesus that died for us. Uh, so we have to be very careful in presenting who Jesus was. Don't make up stories. Don't get tongue-tied. Just tell them who he was. I just told you who he was, real simple and plain. And uh, it should saturate everything that we do. But there's so many people out there that's almost, you know, we sing that song, Miss, Miss Doris, that space, it's an invitational song. It says almost but not quite. Almost, but not quite. And we've got so many people that's going to die and go to hell because they were almost persuaded 
but they didn't quite make it. They didn't quite make it because they never made that commitment. And there again, some people would tell you that's because they didn't make it in church. Well, you don't. You didn't have to make it in church. You make it where you're sitting, uh, and wherever you're sitting. Uh, who did Jesus go to? He didn't go to the church people, the church that was started there, and get them to accept him. He went to sinners, didn't he? He dealt with sinners. In fact, he was called in the Bible a friend of the sinners, and it was a sarcastic remark from the Jews. <laughs> And the Pharisees, they called him a friend of the sinners, and they meant it in an ugly way. But we see today it was in a beautiful way that he was. He, he, he was a friend of the sinners, and that's who he died for. He didn't die for the saved, did he? He died for the sinners. I was one of them. I was one of them. You were one of them. That's who he died for. But when we're talking about evangelism and going out, and taking God's word to make it a personal thing or personal or private appeal, it don't matter. It takes the place of anything else that may come about. Uh, it comes first. Now, we got such selfish people sometimes. Well, I don't have time for it to be first. Now, it can be second or it can be third, but I don't have time for it to be first. Well, you ain't got your heart right. You're not in the right place. You got to change your lifestyle. If you can't put Jesus Christ, the person that died for you first, you need to change your lifestyle and start over and say, okay, I'm putting Jesus first no matter what. And uh, there's always open doors to opportunities all around us. So we got to make it uh, never ending. It's a never ending public appeal to people to bring their life to Christ. I thought I was going to get in the next chapter, but I'm not. I think I've said enough tonight. Uh, but just remember the last thing or about the last paragraph that I just said. If you can't put Christ first, you're not putting him anywhere. You know, you're in the wrong. You need to have a checkup. Time for a checkup. Where's Christ in my life? And if he's not number one, you need to, like we used to do uh, if we were behind playing basketball, we used to call timeout. And we'd go over there and we'd get a little huddle and we'd talk about it. If you're not putting Christ in your life first, call timeout. Have a little huddle, take your Bible and go in there and read about Jesus and read what Jesus did and what he means, what you mean to him. And he should mean the same to you. Any questions or comments? We're going to stop right there tonight. Okay.